Hello there. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Gail Truman. I'm with the Sun Open Storage Business Unit, and uh, have been working with Fedora Commons for several years now. So we're pleased to have Fedora here to talk to us about their open source software, which is used to create, manage, share, and preserve digital content. Um, we have Sony uh, who's the Director of Community and Strategic Alliances, here to tell you all about the uh, powerful software offering. At the end of the presentation, we have some um, information for you about events that are coming out, white papers, and an opportunity to actually try out this powerful system and some fun technology. But right now, I'm going to turn it over to Sony and let you listen and learn about uh, Fedora Commons. Sony. Hi, this is Sony Staples. Um, Thank you, Bill. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be talking, trying not to get uh, real deep technical, but more conceptual about um, how to start thinking about using Fedora. Um, as it says here on the screen, as you see, our, our motto is always, always, and that, and that is meant to uh, reinforce the idea that Fedora is designed to be the foundation for many different kinds of information applications. There's no one specific use case. So, um, moving right along, um, Fedora actually stands for something, though, the letters, the Flexible Extensible Digital Object Repository Architecture, and that says exactly what Fedora is intended to do. The Fedora is an architecture, a conceptual architecture. It's a set of abstractions that were designed by Sandy Payette and Carl Lugosi, with Sandy taking the lead. Um, in 1998, they put a paper together based on some research they were doing around interoperability and, and sharing digital content across institutional lines and um, came up with a set of abstractions. So Fedora is an architecture. It's not exactly software. Fedora Commons, or the Fedora project before it, made software, a specific implementation of the architecture that is, is the software that we're talking about today. Um, it, is, it is a set of abstractions that you can use to to represent your data in different ways. We'll get into that a lot more in just a moment. Um, think of it, the software that we're offering is a repository management system. So it's a complete repository management system, but it's not a complete application for your favorite use case. You have to get other software to do that. And increasingly, more and more application software is coming out, and we're encouraging the community to develop those different kinds of applications for different uses. Um, as I, as I said, I just want to emphasize, Fedora is a, is a very broad, powerful foundation for lots of different kinds of applications. Um, it's designed to make data durable over time, and we like to use the word durability um, because it implies to us that, that the data is in use and it is sustainable over the long term at the same time. And we believe that's increasingly going to be a need. Um, so, and, and as you'll see by the time we get to the end of this presentation, the key to using Fedora well is in the data modeling. There's lots of different ways to use Fedora, um, and I think the community has started to see a few, a few of these different ways as being the best ways to use it. Um, but you can do lots of different things in, in any way you want. So, just a little bit of background for those of you who don't know. Um, the Fedora project um, started in 2001. As I said, um, Fedora itself, the architecture, was developed at Cornell under an NSF grant, and they had software out, Corba based software, in 1998. Um, UVA Library, where I worked, um, in 1999 was starting to look at how we were going to manage all the digital information we had. And I found Sandy's paper and then got to know them, got their software, we played with it a bit, um, we really began to understand it. And then we uh, re-implemented a lightweight version of it that was relatively simple and demonstrated that it could scale up to about 30 million objects in a really simple way. But um, just to, to prove to us that it was worth pursuing. And then at this point, Sandy and I got together and went to the Mellon Foundation, and we got a million-dollar grant for a three-year project that began in 2001, and that's what brought out the very first versions of Fedora. Um, at the end of that grant, um, we went back to Mellon, and they gave us another $1.4 million, which got us through the next three years and got us basically most of the development for what became 3.0. Um, 
at that point, we we knew we couldn't stay on the the, the melon gravy train forever getting grants, so we wanted to do something to make Fedora more sustainable. So we set up Fedora Commons Incorporated, which is a 501c3 private nonprofit company in the U.S. That means you can take charitable donations, so people can give us money. Uh, we don't make we don't make money. Um, so if we make money, it has to go into the back into the, the company. So the Moore Foundation, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, um, gave us at that point um, gave the company a grant for 4.9 million dollars for a four-year project to figure out how to make our business a self-sustaining business. So as the core of a community of developers and users of Fedora, we would be able to be a lean and mean company that could um, continue to coordinate that community and keep the software moving forward and be the propulsion behind the, the community. Um, we are continuing software development. We have in-house programmers, but we're moving towards a community-based software development process. And this year, we are moving much, starting to move much more rapidly towards that. We have many outside committers at this point, and um, have had some major contributions of components to Fedora. And we're also establishing um, part of my purview is where the community strategy is trying to establish other um, community efforts out there to develop solutions on top Fedora for specific use cases and to gather people who are interested in the use cases and get them to work on what we call solution bundles, which are the, the application software plus Fedora that gives you a, a specific way of doing your use case. So we're working on a bunch of those. Um, the world we work in is essentially makes, um, it comes out of the academic background that we, we came out of in the first place. We, all of these different things you see on the screen that we're interested in, and these all tend to be oriented towards nonprofit academic kind of uh, users, but we do have a lot of for-profit people as well. We've written a license such that Fedora can be used for any purpose. But our our focus as a company is on these kinds of things. Scholarly and scientific communication is becoming rapidly becoming an important one. Over time that'll be the more complicated problem to deal with than just relatively straightforward collection building. Data curation is a hot topic these days. Um, we're right at the center of that. Um, a lot of it centers around doing very large data sets, but it essentially is the whole digital library, all digital media, but with an emphasis on large scientific data sets. Open access publishing is another big area that um, Fedora is being used in. Preservation and archiving is an obvious one. We have fairly large usage in that one. And increasingly, we're um, being used in educational applications and research applications in universities um, and virtual knowledge spaces. Um, Fedora can be used to build those as well. So here's a list. Um, there's a, a place on the website. I'll give you the web address at the end. There's a place on the website under the community tab at the top that you can find the user registry, and you can find the list of all the known users. We have 156 known users. We know there are a lot more, but we only know who you are if you tell us. So we, we have no way of tracking who's actually using Fedora. We get more than 25,000 downloads a year now in every country around the world, and so we know it's in use widely. But these are the ones I've been able to ascertain are actually using it for sure. And the interesting thing here is the categories that we divided them into. You'll see that uh, university libraries and archives, which is basically where we started, is still by far our largest group. But our fastest growing in some ways are the research groups and projects, um, which are like scientific projects that are often scattered across multiple institutions or um, humanities computing research projects. Um, National Library is, is one of our largest as well, and there's a lot of them around the world using Fedora. Interesting, lots of interesting other ones. Medical centers using Fedora for medical information as well as library type applications. And another faster, fast growing one is government agencies around the world. A lot of government agencies seem to be getting the message that they can use open source software now. So we're starting to see a lot of growth there. Um, the basic problem that we're trying to deal with is making complex digital information durable. And as I said, this is making it such that the information can continue to be used the way it was intended to be used when it was first put into place for as long as possible. 
this is a really hard problem. Um, there's a lot of dimensions to the problem that we're just beginning to understand. I think Fedora Commons, it's safe to say Fedora Commons sees ourselves as a company who's dedicated to the mission of durability, providing durability services. Right now we see Fedora as the best way to do that, and we mean to keep moving Fedora forward, and we may, it may morph into something else entirely, but we want to be a company who's dedicated to the mission of durability services for digital information. Um, so one of the, the hardest thing, um, one of the hardest things is that you have to continue to make sure that the, the meaning of the content and its very existence is verifiable as the technologies change. The, the application software that uses the, the, that actually delivers and makes visible the content to users is going to be constantly changing, as well as the back-end systems, the software and hardware that actually are used to store the data in different ways. Those things change, have been changing rapidly, and for the foreseeable future, we expect them to continue to change rapidly. But somehow we have to maintain the logical existence and meaning and make it verifiable of the information as all these things change. Uh, the, the, this metaphor I like to use there is that, is that the human body changes, that all the molecules in the human body change over it's like two or three years. Every molecule in your body is a different molecule, but you're still recognizably the same person. But that's the exact same problem we have with digital information. All of those things are changing all the time. So part of that is we know we're not going to necessarily get it exactly right, and so maintaining a history of those changes as we re-encode things and as we move content, the state of the content must be reliably provided so that we know as much as possible we can know exactly what happened to that content as, as time moves on, as, as all of this technology changes. As, a, as at least a last resort, we know we can rebuild it and get it back to where it was maybe later, even if we had to change it irreversibly. Um, hopefully we won't. I mean, that's part of the point of durability is not to change it irreversibly. One of the hardest problems, I think, is is the fact that all of this digital content, as we put it up and put it out there, mean, put it in collections and put it up on the web, um, and what people want to do with it immediately is, is start to put it together, start to grab things from one place and put them together with another. I mean, you know how the web's developed, and I, I'm firmly convinced that the web, the World Wide Web, is a model for how humans are going to be doing information for the rest of our time, and a beginning model, a first step. And, and to be able to operate with durability kinds of services in a world where you have very complex interconnected data, so you have all, any given unit of content, any image, any text, anything that you're putting up could, could take on more than one context over time as people discover it and reuse it. And I think the whole scholarly effort is all about doing such things. So being able to manage the simple existence of the content and then to manage it in its relationships with all the other content is is, is, is central to the durability problem. And what's implied in that last statement is that these resources are, are complex and they will increasingly be um, managed and delivered across institutional boundaries, meaning people will start to put together things that are not from one collection, not from one repository that's being served. So we have to also, in addition to having complex context for these these digital resources. There are going to be complex social and political issues behind it, and we have to have ways to make sure we can handle that. The door is, is very much on a track to be able to do that kind of stuff. The Fedora abstractions provide a durability framework. So there's a set of abstractions about data and how you think of data and how you use data that Fedora provides, and the software is all about making those abstractions usable. So content, each unit of content is a, da is a data object. And, and in Fedora terms, what a data object means is you have one or more components of content plus one or more components of metadata or not, maybe. Generally, a, a, a digital object has at least one component of content and one of metadata. Sometimes you can have objects that are metadata only, but then still the same. As far as Fedora is concerned, really, metadata and data are just data streams in an object. Um, you can also have policies um, that apply to different components and different views of objects, and you have formalized relationships among the, among those objects, 
and then you have the history of everything that happens to that object, all unitized in the data object. So rather than having some master catalog somewhere with all that data in it, everything is managed with the object that is the point of the, the exercise. Um, so what this means is when you really are set out to represent more complex digital resources, like a book, for example, where you might have a transcription of a text and a bunch of page images, um, you're actually often defining more than one object in, with a, like a web-type view of a complex graph of objects is your notion of how to deliver the book. We'll get into that more in a moment. Um, the public view, there's one set of abstractions that are exposed to the application layer software of a public view, and that is based on behavior. So the, what the application software does is it, it calls on different behaviors of the objects. By, and they're all just URLs, and there's a, a pattern of URLs that are known ahead of time that any given object, class of objects, can can deliver from. So the user of the the user interface designer can know that ahead of time and understand it abstractly and be able to to work with the objects. And then the back end abstractions are the, the data object itself, the data streams are abstracted out ideas of where the files live and what their characteristics are on whatever kind of storage um, you have them on. So that, that it's the interplay, the, the division of those two abstractions is where Fedora is the, the logical layer that, that connects those two up, and you'll see this more in a moment. Um, and the Fedora is, is, is in its essence, at its basis, a web services um, kind of um, top software that um, makes it possible to have this, this kind of um, complex web sort of view. So this picture tries to get at that idea a little bit more clearly, I hope. Um, Fedora is in that middle rectangle. It's the abstract data management layer. So in that layer, the logical meaning of the content stays as stable as possible. Above that, you see all different kinds of applications. So these are applications that are making, creating data objects, putting data into the repository, and taking data out of the repository for access in different ways based on different use cases. Ideally, Fedora, Fedora repository should be able to have more than one face for more than one use. So you might have um, staff in the, in the library that has the preservation and archiving application that they're using to manage the objects. Increasingly, we're developing scholars' repositories, which are aimed at putting information community, information creation activities on top of repositories so that the information as it's created, it's in a repository in the first place. So you have two different applications that may be looking at the same repository. In the back end, so those things are, can, and those things are changing all the time as well. In the back end, you have different kinds of storage. So the files that you're delivering and managing are stored in different places. And so the, the data objects present one set of abstractions back to those storage solutions and another set of abstractions out to those applications. So, all right, so the basic abstractions we're talking about here are data objects, which I've already started talking about, content models, which are class mechanisms so you can talk about the rules and the characteristics of a whole class of data objects. Behaviors of objects, which I've already mentioned, are the views, the different transformations of the underlying content to have an abstract view of a set of behaviors it is what Fedora presents to the world. You have policies about objects, and these are formal policies that are about things like access control, but there are much more, there's a lot more you can do with policies. But they give you a way to finally control access and, and use of all the different components and different views of an object, and then the formalized relationships among the objects. With those five things, um, the Fedora software gives you a, a whole array of possibilities. So, starting off with the data object, this picture is our way of sort of abstracting what it looks like. So at the bottom, you see 1, 2, and N. These are the custom data streams. This is when you, your architect of your repository designs the way you're going to use your repository, you're essentially defining what kinds of data objects you're going to have in your repository. 
And the first thing you do is start talking about what, what are the different components of each of the data objects. So, for example, if I have an image object and I manage, um, maintain um, thumbnail files already created and I maintain the screen size and maybe then the master, the master image that was digitized for, I maintain that for archival purposes and to recreate the other two, those things would be user-defined data streams, custom data streams. Metadata, descriptive metadata, administrative metadata about this object would also be data streams. So the data stream is, is the basic unit that talks about the data that's stored and brings it into this abstraction of an object. The object also provides a set of data streams that Fedora maintains for you. Um, the DC data stream is a real simple Dublin core data stream that Fedora just maintains because you've got to have a bit of metadata for the repository to run. Um, Wells X is the um, external relationships from the object. That's where you put IDF triples, um, resource description framework triples that talk formally express the relationship from this object to other objects. The audit trail um, data stream is where it keeps track of a complete list of every action that's happened to this object in its, its history. So Fedora maintains that every time the, the an API call is made that affects the object, Fedora has a, an entry in the audit trail. And then the policies, you can have policies that are specifically connected to the object and all of its components and views. You can also have policies that are repository-wide that apply to classes of objects, but that's, um, those are stored elsewhere. But some policies are actually stored directly in the object. So each object has a variety of properties that you can use in your, in, in your um, exploit in the and the durability services that you're building on top of it. So the PID, the persistent identifier, is a unique identifier for each object that's maintained and required to be unique by the repository. Fedora provides a, a, an ID generator um, when you start it up. It has a namespace that you define, and then it has a colon, and then Fedora by de default will generate numbers starting from one to infinity, never repeating and use those as PIDs. If you want your own PID system, you can ingest objects with your own PID already in it. Fedora won't replace it, but it will, it will, if it's not unique, it'll take it back and tell you so. So Fedora does um, require that everything be unique and, and maintain that. Um, there are four different kinds of objects, and what we're talking about right now are just data objects. There are three other system type objects that we'll talk about in a minute. So that just tells you what kind of object you've got. It always maintains the created date and the last modified date, so you know when the object was first created and when it was modified. There is a state um, variable that tells you whether the, the object is active, inactive, or deleted. It also has a purge, so you can uh, you can mark something as deleted, but it'll stay there as long as you want, and then you can mark it as purged and have it cleaned up in any kind of scheme that you want to apply. And then it's got labels. It tells you what content model, and it tells you who the owner is. Um, in our notion of a repository, the, the repository authority isn't necessarily going to be the owner of all the objects inside it. Um, in, the, in the Scholars Repository application, the, uh, idea, the, the idea behind it is that each content creator will be the owner of their content for as long as they want. Then they may hand it off to some other owner, like the library or archive, for long-term um, durability, but they can maintain it as long as they want. So Fedora lets you maintain that distinction. And a lot of the, the ways that Fedora operates are now being oriented directly around the, the um, owner. So there's four different types of data streams, these internal, these um, uh, user-defined data streams that you can you can mix and match any way you want. You can have any number of them. So the first kind is managed content. And if you have an object and you define that it's got a data stream that's managed content, what happens is when you create that object, you you give a URL for where to go and find the content that Fedora is going to manage in that data stream. And then if it's if it's marked manage, Fedora takes that URL, goes and gets the file, writes it to its own backend file space, and updates the address, puts the address that it uses to get to that particular file. It doesn't have to always be a file, but just assume it's a file for the moment. Um, an external data stream operates somewhat the same way. You give it a URL to tell where the content is, and Fedora takes the URL, 
It goes and looks at the file. It creates a, uh, a checksum and gets some metadata about the file, which it stores in the Fedora object, but it leaves the file where it is and just stores the URL. So you can have a Fedora object that has pointers to data that sits on servers all around the world. And there are applications of Fedora that do nothing but build Fedora objects that surrogate access to files that are managed all in, in a variety of different locations. So providing different semantic views on top of data that's served up elsewhere. Um, so in this case, you can't do anything about the, the data. The repository can't keep someone from deleting it, but it can certainly let you know when it's gone, and it certainly has the information to let you know that it's the same data that it was last time someone tried to get to it. External redirected is another, much like the external, except um, the external and managed content data streams, when the user asks for a view of the content, they never actually see the URL of the, of the real file itself. And um, it all streams through Fedora. External redirected is there for in applications where you can't stream the content through Fedora. And in that case, if you use an external redirected, the, the um, URL of the content will actually be displayed to the user at certain points in the process. Inline XML is where you have in the Fedora object itself, and a Fedora object is an XML file. Fedora manages a bunch of XML files. Um, to, for the repository. All the information is written directly into XML. The inline XML data stream actually puts some XML data, metadata, in the in the Fedora object, the Foxmall object itself. Foxmall is the Fedora object XML, which is our schema for building these object representations. So the inline XML, you actually put the data in that in that file. Um, you have to be careful with that because when people have very verbose metadata, that object, your object that everything works on can grow very large. But for certain applications, having the metadata directly in the object is required, so it's there. But you can mix and match these any way you want. So each of the data stream also has deleted, so you can actually take certain um, data streams out of action for a while if you want for a particular object. Um, you have a formal ID for each data stream in the object. You have state variables that tell you when it's um, in line with different, four different kinds of, uh, of data stream that I just talked about. You have the, whether it's versionable. You can Fedora versions at the data stream level. So any given data stream is automatically versioned unless you tell it not to, which means it just adds another data stream and it's considered an instance of one of the, the basic data streams. So you define the number of data streams and then each one of those data streams, the, the basic data streams in the object, is always, you always get the current version when you ask for something out of the object unless you specify a version. And every time you update one of those data streams, it gets version data streams that are tied to it behind the scenes. But each one of those is, it just keeps track of what the creation time was of that. So it endlessly versions unless you tell it not to. And there are different, in the APIs, it gives you ways to manage versions. So if you have applications that are generating lots of versions and you want to get rid of some, we give you the way to do that. But in general, it, it's all versions. Um, the content models are, as a version 3.0 of Fedora, they're formalized as objects in the system. These are objects that represent classes of data objects. But the, the reference implementation of how these objects are done right now that we distribute, there's a schema for the, there's a data stream in the object that defines the rules for the types of data streams, how many data streams and what their types are in any given class of objects. Um, that is, replaceable by you if you want. You can put your own scheme in there and manage them yourself. But then Fedora builds some structure around the content model objects. So the content model object defines the number and types of data streams for the objects of that class. And it also binds that each object through the content model, the C model object it's called, binds that that data object to some services that provide the behaviors that we talked about earlier. And we'll get to that in a minute. So, this is we get to it now. The uh, uh, behaviors are truly optional in the Fedora repository if you want. There are very good reasons to have them. Um, if you don't have behaviors, you can just have data streams and you can just access the data streams by name. 
um, and disseminate the, each data stream. If you if you step up to having behaviors, then you have that abstract set of URLs that are always available that talk about that allow the world to view that object in a in a specifically um, defined set of ways. And the back end of that object may not have data that looks like those behaviors. In the case of the data streams, you can only get the data streams that you're storing if you don't have behaviors. If you have behaviors, you can actually transform the data that's in the data streams that you're managing to provide a, a virtual set of data products out of the front end of the repository. It's a very powerful idea that um, can be exploited in some very interesting ways. Um, but also what it does, it, the, 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 these behavior objects, Define a set of abstract behaviors and then connect up to a set of implementations, back-end services that can carry out that, that whatever transformation is needed to make the behavior happen on the data that you have on hand. So what's really happening here is you have this abstract view, like I said, out the front that are the behaviors, but the business logic of what you're storing and how you're managing it in the back end is completely separated from that. Um, the, the data streams are connected to the behaviors. You can't do a behavior that you don't have a service that knows how to operate on the kind of content, but it does from the use point of view, it, it completely separates it. So um, the, here's an example that uses two different kinds of image objects that I hope will make that somewhat clearer. So I have general image objects, and you see those blue rectangles are the different data streams. I'm just talking, not worrying about the metadata here, but say you have a simple image object that has four data streams. You have a thumbnail that's a pre-computed file. Those little green circles represent files. So the the, the the Fedora object has the address of the thumbnail file, the address of some medium res file, the address of the highest res file that you're willing to give out, and then the original scan max res master file. Um, and then the object below is a JPEG 2000 object, and the JPEG 2000 itself is a master file, but it's used to derive all of the different versions, so you're really only maintaining one file if you're using that object. Both objects subscribe in the middle to the service de description. You see the green set, and that's a set of four behaviors, very simple behaviors. Get thumbnail, get the medium size, get the high res, and get the max image. Um, what, what's happening here, that's a very, the service de description is essentially metadata that describes a set of behaviors, the, the, the expectation for a set of behaviors. And, and then an, each object that subscribes to a particular service description saying, my data can do that, that set of, of behaviors, and then they have to be subscribed also to a service mechanism that is the set of functions that carry out that, those behaviors for the data streams that the object carries. So the top, op the top object, the general image object, the functions in the service mechanism are very simple. They just say, get the data stream and send it back. So when I say, when I say, give the PID of the general image object and say, get me the thumbnail, it just goes and gets the file and sends it back to the browser. As I said earlier, generally it's a, it's an external or managed content data stream and it's funneling it back through Fedora and so the, the URL is not visible to the user. In the case of the JPEG 2000 image object, when I give the PID of that object and say, get me a thumbnail, the object makes the connection to the behavior mechanism and gets the program that it needs to generate that thumbnail on the fly, and it sends it back to the, to the browser. So all the, the idea here is that you build your user interface against the service description, and it stays as stable as it can as you change objects in the background. Um, you can add another kind of object. For example, before people were doing JPEG 2000, they were doing Mr. Sid, which were close to JPEG 2000, but a little bit different. So if you had your Mr. Sid objects, they would operate much like the JPEG 2000 here, but then you're going to move to JPEG 2000. You can add another content model, keep the behaviors as stable as possible, and then just just add the, the new services that let you get the different type of, of, of file to operate on. So the way this all fits together in Fedora terms, and this is where we get the four basic objects that are in Fedora, any Fedora repository. On the, on the left, lower left, you see the data objects. They essentially subscribe to a content model to, with a, and it uses RDF in, in the RELSX to do it. That says, I am, I am, a, 
a member of the class of um, C model objects defined by the C model. Um, so the C model is essentially the, the rules for a class of object, and the data object can be verified against the rules in the C model. But then the data object inherits its connection to the service objects that we were just talking about through the C model. So you can actually have a data object subscribed to more than one C model to get different behaviors. But to keep it simple, we'll talk right now about this. So you see the service definition object, that's that set of abstract behaviors. The C model subscribes to that, and then it has a contract with a service mechanism that can carry out those behaviors for that particular set of data streams that are defined. And then the back end, uh, the service mechanism uh, has some back end web services that actually allow it to do those things that it needs to do. For example, when you have, um, a dissemination is an XML, you have an XML data stream and you want to grab a chunk of that XML out and hand it back to a client, um, you have to have a back-end service that, that uses XSL um, to do that. And so that's an example of a back-end service that would be bound to a method in a service mechanism. Okay. Um, so behavior call is, is, is almost completely known ahead of time. When in your discovery process, you discover kids of objects, and then you know there's a set of, of URL templates that you already know by reflecting on the repository and looking at the behaviors, the user interface designer can understand ahead of time a set of, of, of templates for the different kinds of behaviors, and all they have to do is, subject, is, is substitute the PID. So, to call an object, to get a behavior of an object, you give the PID plus the name of the, the service definition, so that's the whole package of behaviors. The name of that plus the method within that package, those three things together will give you the behavior. And you don't have to know any more about the object than that. Um, and the URL looks like the example there. You see the HTTP colon slash slash and the, the address of your repository. And this is your, you establish at configuration time what your repository's main address is. And then the Fedora get and the URL of the, I mean the, sorry, the PID of the object is XX X colon one. The PID of the SDEF, because it's a, just another Fedora object, so it has a PID. And then the name of the method within the SDEF. You can also add parameters onto the end of that. So you could say, I could have a behavior that says, get me sized image, and has a parameter that I give a number of pixels. And it generates the, the uh, image back based on that, fitting into that pixel box. So you can say, you can have a, a, a parameter on the end of the behavior that says, this is the pixel box I want it to fit into now. Um, you can also have a date time stamp on the end of the object, the end of the be um, behavior call to the object. And that what that does, it reassembles the, the object, the view of the object as it looked on the day you, the date and time you gave it. So it interpolates all the different versions of the data stream so that the ones that were in operation on the day day and time that you specify will be the ones in action. Now, if Fedora keeps those things, it'll keep them forever. It only, only if you keep them viable, meaning you, the services are all still there to make them work the way they work. A lot of the reasons from, so often for, for making versions of things is because you don't want to continue to support them. So you have to have ways of, um, if you want to maintain the version, you have to figure out ways of doing that. But Fedora gives a way to do it and manage it. Up front. So, all right, and then, as I said, policies can be formally expressed in the repository. So, every one of the components I've talked about, you can have a different policy for. So, for each behavior and for each data stream in an object, so the object as a whole, I can define a behavior that governs activities associated with that, and Fedora enforces it. It uses the exact mole, um, which I forget what exactly what it stands for, but it's a um, it's a pretty widely accepted XML schema for expressing policies. Um, and you can write policies in exact mole and apply them to each of those different components, and Fedora will resolve them for you. Um, so when you write these policies, you're essentially talking about who can do 
what the what with which component of the of the data that's in the repository. Um, they can be very simple rules, and a lot of what policies are all about are at this point are really just access control. You're saying who, based on the characteristics of the user that I'm dealing with right now, you match the characteristics of the user up with any characteristics that are defined in the policy to say what they can do with what thing that the policy is applied to. Um, so you can also have policies that are applied across the whole repository. So, for example, I can write a policy that says objects that are of this content model have these policies associated with them, and you store those in the repository rather than in the object, but it lets you do both. Um, okay. Um, now, let's, um, I want to turn to some examples. That's basically the entire set of what the basic concepts that Fedora gives. There's lots of different kinds of utilities and things that let you work with all those different things. Um, there are a lot of hooks. There are APIs that let you um, get at all the different components I've been talking about. And when you when people write applications on top of Fedora, that's what they take advantage of. But the, the Fedora repository service itself operates on those five abstractions that we've talked about. So let's look at a couple of examples here. The first one um, is a historical census object. And this is a uh, the census, the aggregate census file for the U.S. in 1870. It's a relatively simple file. It's been crunched down a whole lot over what the census that was taken, the individuals that were, were quizzed in the census. This is the aggregate of that. So it's not that large a file. Um, it has a set of data streams. It has the character data representation of the, of the data set itself. So a CDS file that has, you know, comma separated variables with quotes around them. That's what we considered in this particular kind of object, the sort of master file. So that's the thing that we, is as stable as possible. It also has a data stream that's a DDI codebook. That's a data documentation initiative, which is a, an XML schema for describing codebooks for data sets. So we may, in, in this object, and I'll show it to you in just a second, um, it has these two data streams so far that are the master copy of the data, the code book, which is the structural and descriptive metadata about the data set. It has a data stream that is a set of information, a small bit of XML that lets you, that describes the, how you connect to an SQL database where the same data is stored for access purposes. Um, in this particular model, one reason I wanted to show this is that shows that you can use data streams and policies and things in different ways. So in this case, the data, if you're familiar with the OAIS model, the, the DIP or the dissemination information package that's used to deliver the data out to the web is actually out in, the, in an SQL database. The SQL database and the client that sits on top of it has a private relationship to the repository that access to the world is only done through the object. But, so there's a, there are policies that are written that don't allow anyone to touch the SQL database except the, the client that talks to the, through the Fedora repository. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and then the idea is the SQL database can always be rebuilt from that comma separated variable file. Um, so let's look at how it looks. So here we've gone to, um, this is the default way of viewing Fedora objects. If you look up in the, in the browser's address window and you see the, the address of the repository here at one at the University of Virginia, you see the get function, the get verb there, and then the PID. So that's the PID of this object. It's uva dash live colon 115. And by, if you just give the PID of the object and hit return, it'll bring you to this page so you can look at the object. This is looking at those those different attributes of the object that I talked about earlier. So there's the, the PID of the object. It's got a label that gives you a title, essentially, for the object. It tells you which content model it's part of. It tells you uh, which of the four types this object is, and this is a data object. And it gives you creation data, you know, creation and modification data, and the owner ID. Actually, I think this object was done before we had owners. But So you see above, you can view the different disseminations, and you can view the item index, which is the data streams. So if we look at the second, the item index, these are the four data streams. Um, at this object, as I said, there's the raw data at the bottom, which is the CDS file, the, the character set, character version of the data, the code book, the DB config file, which is that SQL connection data, and then there's the, the required Dublin Core metadata that the repository needs.
So if you look at them, the code book looks like this. If you click on that link, you can actually see the content. So it's the, you know, basically XML. This is the, the CDF file looks like this. Again, if you click directly on that in the interface, you click on that, you'll actually see the data. This is the bit of information that you need to talk to, that the client needs to talk to Fedora to use the data that's in the data streams, but to deliver through Fedora the data that's in the SQL database, sorry. Um, and then this is a view of some of the behaviors. So this object has behaviors that are things like get the abstract for the to the object, the abstract for the metadata, get the citation for this data object, get some technical information, the variable list, etc. So these particular disseminations, only these behaviors use the code book only. They don't use any of the data. So um, when a lot of the operations on this object are just using the code book, and then some operations use both the code book and the data or, or the connection to the SQL database. So this is, if you run the, the object and you do the, the basic dissemination that brings up the, the general view, you bring up the abstract out of the code book, and this gives you the summary of what the, this object's about. Um, over here on the left, the, the, the way this, when this was rendered by the client, it um, knew in advance about all those different disseminator calls that could be made, and it buries them under these, makes this menu down the left, and underneath each one is just a dissemination call back to the repository. So the, it's already done the abstract one, so if you click on, I think, clicking on the variable list, brings up, goes to the code book and pulls out the chunk of XML and hands it back to the client, which renders it into this view, which just gives you the basic information about each variable that's contained in the code book. If I click on browse data, I get a form, and the form lets me choose a set of variables that goes also into the code book, gets the variable list, makes this form, and then lets the user choose, and when you click on browse selected data, it's, it's the client is gathering this data from the code book, creating an SQL job that it's using on its back-end SQL database, and then sending the data, the result, back out to the repository. So here, basically, you're just looking at a table of the data that you asked for. It also can, there's another one that lets you extract data. In the same way, it uses the code book. It has a form that the user can click on to say, these are the fields and columns, the rows and columns out of this data set that I want to download. And when it says go, the client uses that data, builds an SQL job, which then feeds the data back out to Fedora. So the policies that you have on this, this object can still control the access, even though it's being done by an external client. All right, so that's a simple object that stands on its own pretty much. Um, a lot of different ways of modeling data in Fedora require you to break up what you think of as one physical object when you're making a surrogate of it. To, you make more than one digital object, and together with them exploiting the relationships of that graph of objects is how you represent the object, the object in question. So the book is a good example, which I'll show you in just a minute. So the, this is all based on how you exploit relationships. And as I said before, these are, these are RDF relationships, um, resource description framework that, uh, um, to say that this PID has a certain form of relationship to that PID, and you put those things in indexes and you can search them in different ways, and it, it allows you to assemble different kinds of aggregation objects, objects that represent aggregations of other objects. There are two main styles that have evolved out of using, doing this kind of stuff with Fedora and the atomistic object modeling um, approach that I was, what I was just talking about where you have many objects with relationships. Um, and in this case, um, it's much more flexible. The other, the other kind of uh, model is what we call the compound model, which you, you put many more kinds of data streams in the same object. So you have larger objects with many data streams. For example, you can have a book. If I have a book, a book in, that I digitize, and say I've got a, a transcription of the book plus I've got page images of the book, um, in the atomistic object model, I would put all of the image data in, in separate objects and have the book, all of the data, any data file that's about the book as a whole. So the say I have a PEI XML file and I have a PDF for convenience. Um, those two data streams would be in the book object, and each page image or part of the book 
is in a separate object that has a is part of relationship back to the the book object. In the compound model, all of the data streams, the book data streams, and each image data stream are in there. Um, I think uh, in the in the case of what we're talking about with these complex kinds of um, uses of, of of objects later, where people want to like grab a plate out of a book and use it in another context, the atomistic object. The atomistic model makes it a lot more flexible for doing that kind of stuff. People coming to Fedora often, it's more intuitive to them that if they have a physical object, that has to be one Fedora object. And I'm not, you know, the jury's still out on what's the exact right way to do it, but I lean towards the atomistic model myself. So, book object, as I was just talking about, if you use the atomistic approach for a 400 page book, I'd have 401 objects. The parent object or the main object that you access in discovery and access processes is the book object, and then it in turn accesses the image objects. Using the compound approach, um, I have one object that in this case would have 1201 data streams. So what that means is if I have a compound object for the book, any other process that, any other context where I want to use a page image out of that book, the connection, the use of that, that reuse of that data stream would have to come through the book object, had to negotiate the semantics of the book to get at the thing. All the, all the management functions that you do over time for images would all have to be done on these larger objects that are mixed image semantics and book semantics. So I think the two, the two reasons for um, preferring the atomistic model over the compound are both when I manage something, I manage only the the thing as a whole, the unit of content. If the unit of content is the book, then I manage all of the data streams that are about the book as a whole in one object, and then I manage if I have page images which are essentially part of that book, I manage them as separate objects. And then for when I want to migrate my data over time, I just have to um, if I'm doing image migrations, I don't have to mess with the other book, with the book objects. Anyway, this sort of looks like this. So I can have the Modern English Collection, which is all of the English English text in our library. I have each text is an object that has a relationship back to the collection, and then the page images have a relationship to the text. What that looks like um, in this case. So I, if I've discovered this book, The Natural History of Carolina, Florida, and the Bahama Islands, and I disseminate the book, I'm disseminating the book as a whole and getting this, this layout that's showing me the page, so this book only has page images. So I'm seeing the page images, but I have access to all of the, the book as a whole, so I can turn page turn through the book. So say the the, in this case, the main data stream in the book object is a math file, then the, the access to the book comes through the book object and it lets me have behaviors that let me turn pages and, and do things with the, the page image objects. So in this case, there's actually 20, 20 um, thumbnails on this page. It's done 21 different behaviors. It's done a behavior to get to, from the book the whole structure, and then it's done a behavior for each child that it finds a relationship to in the book, it, it does the get thumbnail for them and embeds them in the page. So in the end of here, I have a case where I have these different functions. I've clicked on, on the tools and actions menu under one of these pages, and I can start disseminating that image, that child, because I know these things that image objects can do. Moving right along. So in general, what we're talking about here are objects that represent aggregations of other objects. The example I just showed you is is an, um, an example of a, an explicit aggregation where I have a, a set of child objects and I have an aggregation, which is the book that says there's all these children, these related objects, and you organize them and look at them in this order. Um, you can also have implicit implicit aggregations for things like representing collections. So if I have an implicit implicit aggregation, each of the children asserts a relationship to the parent, but the parent doesn't explicitly know about the children. When you when you discover a collection or you want to use the collection, you get the, the collection object, the parent aggregation object, which has information about the collection. So in the case of modern English, it would have 
my t our collecting for our library that maintains this modern English collection, our reasons for doing it, uh, the characteristics of the collection, et cetera, are in the parent object. And then when I want to list all of the, the books that we have in that collection, it goes to the resource index, which is the index that indexes all these RDF triples and brings back a list of all the children. And so what, what that means is the implicit collection never has to be listed anywhere. It's just created at the time you, you use it. So if, if I have my, I'm digitizing all the books in my collection, every time I digitize a book that, uh, that is part of the modern English collection, I just put a relationship in that book object's data it asserts the relationship, I am a member of that collection, and the next time the collection is accessed, it just is included in the list, but no one has to maintain the list. Um, so, and it, with the uh, explicit aggregations, I've pretty much talked about. We're just I'm a little running a little behind time, so we'll just skip that. Um, and that, and that, and that. Oops, sorry. Okay, so well, I'm just talking about implicit aggregations. This is not basically I've said all this already. Um, again, the, the idea is that you instantiate the idea of the collection as an object. It has metadata. It has the rules about how you go and find the children, looking in the resource index for the particular kind of relationship, and, and then operations on that parent can give you access to all the children that have asserted the relationship. And that looks just like this. So the, all these um, objects on the right are, say, they're book objects, and they've all asserted the relationship to say there is a member of the object that's PID1, which say that's the modern English collection. Um, and then by building indices of the, um, the RDF, you can can access those relationships. So, searching. Now, this is um, something people, when they come to Fedora, they don't always really understand. There's a, everyone looks for the search when they come to Fedora, and if you look in the Fedora repository service, there's a built-in search. It was, it, all it does is index and search the Dublin Core metadata. It's never, it was never intended to be exposed to end users. It was put there for repository managers because repository managers need to be able to find their objects in different ways. The, the approach that we really believe is the right one is you have a service that lets you build indices and exploit them. Um, and that's a service that's part of what we call the Fedora Service Framework. We have an example, our reference implementation of that is called G-Search. And G-Search is a search that, that's in the Fedora Framework that works with the Fedora Repository Services, which will be different. That's what we've been talking about the whole time here is the Fedora Repository Service. So we have a G-Search service that works with that, and it lets you assemble the desired um, index based on patterns of disseminations or um, data streams. You can go around and say you can write a template for a, uh, an index that says I only want these kinds of objects and I only want the, you know, the get Dublin Core record um, service to be the, that data to be handed back to the service so I can build a Dublin Core kind of uh, so I have a disseminator that uses the mod data stream and it creates a rich Dublin core that I want for access. I can, I can schedule all of the objects of a certain type or certain classes that I want to have that dissemination be handed back to the index and I can build the index um, on the fly. So Pro AI is another service that works the same way. It's our, our OAI server. Um, it also I'll show you here. This is a picture of how it fits together. So um, the repository service is over there on the left, and the G-Search service sits out there, and it has different index templates that have been written that it is keeping track of. And now that we have we have messaging services built into this framework as well, the G-Search can be talking to the uh, um, listening for events that happen in the repository. So you define an index 
that you're going to build in G-Search. And the first time you do it, G-Search goes and it hits on the repository and grabs all the right either behaviors or data streams for the pattern of objects that are defined in the, that particular index, builds the index, and then from then on, G-Search sits there listening for objects or events that happen in the repository that affect the pattern of objects that they're each index was set up to manage, right? So the, when any event happens in the repository, like someone updates an object and hits on one of the data streams that that particular index was set up to be affected by, then it automatically, incrementally, incrementally indexes that. So well, the Pro AI works the same way. So I, if you have, if that wasn't clear, we can get out of the question and answer. As like I said, I'm running over. So here's the URL. Um, like if we, we're going to have time for questions still. That's one reason I was rushing. I didn't want to run too far over. So um, please take a look at the at the website and um, ask me any questions you want. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we are ready to begin the question and answer uh, session. Sorry, we're not quite ready. We have a couple okay. more slides. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay, a um, couple of conferences coming up that I encourage you to um, attend if you're able. Uh, both these conferences, Fedora Commons will be present. Um, we will also have fun showcasing some of the integrations that we've done with the Fedora Commons software. Um, particularly, the integrations are focusing on our open storage products so that we can uh, offer an end-to-end -end open stack. Um, and we've done a lot of optimization um, or characteristics on performance and scaling and things to help um, customers select the kind of uh, configurations that make sense based on performance capacity in those requirements and things like that. Um, and I've got a URL uh, on the next slide that talks about that. So coming up, we have Open Repositories in May. Um, that's in Atlanta. Following that, in June, we have the Sun Preservation Archive Special Interest Group, PASIG. Um, great chance to meet other customers, some partners um, in the repository and archiving space, and a lot of working groups there. This is actually in Europe this time. It's an event that we do twice a year, and we're in uh, Malta. Um, and there's a white paper done by Mike Keller of Stanford that we're encouraging to you to download if you're at all interested in learning more about uh, his perspectives on digital libraries and data creation. That's the next slide. Okay. Um, we have um, a way for you to actually put your hands on building out your own repository using Fedora and some of the fun technology. Obviously, you can also run Fedora on whatever, whatever platform you have. Uh, a couple of URLs here. The um, software you can develop and you can download, obviously, from SourceForge, but um, I put the URL here for Fedora Commons so that you can go there and, and download it. Um, the try and buy program from Sun, it's uh, no obligation, 60 days to try out whatever service storage you'd like to try out, and just kind of basically kick the tires. Um, if you want a ready-to-go appliance, I point you to the Sun 7000 Unified Storage Server, which is available from that website. It's very easy to point and click and find it. If you have any um, more custom configurations and looking at something different, feel free to drop me an email and I'll make sure that we work with you to, to give you what you need. And uh, thanks very much, Bonnie. We're going to open it up to a Q&A now. And I did see something coming in from uh, Rafael Alvado. I don't know, Rafael, if you're on the line. A lot of uh, interesting chatter going on around linking elements of objects. I'll try to answer your question if I can. Raph? Well, I, I, I did see I did see that some of those questions. Let me just say that um, the idea behind the the Wells X data stream is that they are object to object relationships. Um, in the Wells X data stream, you can put any kind of RDF you want. So you can have metadata kinds of RDF expressions and but relations. But the real intent was to have it be whole object relationships to whole other objects. So it actually it, it, it assumes the object, the pit of the object that you're asserting from when you put the triple in there, and then you you have the the formal relationship that expresses what the relationship is, and then the object pit, which is the other object that you're making the relationship to. Does that answer the question? I saw some. I just quickly was reading some of that. I don't know if that answers it, but. Okay. 
Uh, Raphael responded back, okay, whole object to whole object. Um, so, Bernie, we have a couple questions that came in um, online. So, from Darren Cohen, I don't know if um, Bernie answered this question earlier or if this answer through the chat, but this question was, if Dublin Core is mandatory, how does one handle non-Roman scripts? Uh, handle non-Roman scripts. Dublin Core... The Dublin Core that's mandatory is actually made by the repository. You can override it. I mean, you can put your own Dublin Core in that data stream, and Fedora will do its best to use it. Um, I believe it's um, it's all Unicode aware, I'm pretty sure. So I don't think there's a problem with non, non-Roman non character sets. Um, but like I said, it's um, it's really only intended for management of the repository. Um, you can have you can have your own data stream in an object, but you put a much richer Dublin Core if you want to maintain one in it, and that's a good idea. Rather than putting don't don't overuse the the one that's there. It's there because there has to be some key metadata for the repository to operate. And at the time we started, we just picked up Dublin Core and ran with it. And people get confused by that. So if you're going to do rich Dublin Core yourself. Put it in your own data stream and, and treat it separately. Okay. Um, another question. This is from Rafael Alvarado again. Um, how does Fedora handle linking elements of media objects, say a region of an image, a segment of text? Um, it doesn't explicitly. I mean, Fedora just, you can, it's how you, you, the triples that you make that you put in the Rails X, and again, remember, the triples are always essentially tuples because they're assumed the pit of the object that you're putting the, the relationship in to search it to some other object. So, I mean, you can, you can have your own RDF that can make relationships, and you can even do this in the rel text, actually. You can put relationships in there that have the, say, um, dissemination calls, behavior calls, the URL, as I said, it's always a URL. You can have that be the resource, and you can assert a relationship to that. But then it's all about how you use it. The intent of the rel text was really in the beginning to be about building this graph. I say, I, I, I specify a particular object, which is a, a combination of different content components and metadata. That thing is one unit of content. And I assert that that unit of content has a particular formal relationship to another unit of content. That's what Fedora is intending that to be, and that's, but it can be any RDF you want. Um, right? Does that make sense for us? Okay. Um, more questions. I just need to scroll through. Um, the next question is um, from Brian West Westra. This question is on the web. But what kind of programming skills are needed to work with this graph? Oh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> um, I mean. All different kinds, actually. I mean, uh, like I said before, Fedora, Fedora is a complete application in that it's a repository management system. It gives you the, the basics of repository management. If you want an institutional repository system, you need to develop your own application for your use case that exploits Fedora on top of that. So if you choose to build that in um, PHP, like several people have done with things like Islandora and Fez, are both PHP-based systems, then working, you have to understand the APIs that Fedora has, but you can do that with PHP. If you actually want to get into Fedora and and um, work on the, the code itself, it's all in Java. So Fedora is written in Java. Um, we are increasingly, we now have some much more lightweight user interfaces that people are developing and things like Ruby. There's Active, Active Fedora, which is put out by Matt Zumwalt um, from Media Shelf Incorporated is a close friend and member of our community that's very active, and he contributed the REST API to Fedora, and he's contributing this active Fedora library, which essentially lets you treat, treat Fedora objects as Ruby gems, as I understand. I'm not a Ruby programmer, but so if you're a Ruby programmer, you can use active Fedora to rapidly develop applications on top of Fedora. 
Um, you don't necessarily need to know anything beyond the APIs and the abstractions that Fedora provides. As a Ruby programmer, then you can develop what you want on top, right? Did that answer your question? Okay. Next question comes from Carla Omer. Uh, can we use Fedora for, learn for a learning object repository? Sure. I mean, you, if you can, using the abstractions that I talked about, if you can express your data in, in architecturally as those abstractions, and then you can to build your client systems on top of it that know how to get things in and out, what Fedora will do is take, take care of all that data for you and provide all the durability layer. I mean, ideally what we're talking about here is that we have to get to a point where the repositories are out there and, and we're not reinventing the data management for each new kind of application. Just to get a new set of tools, you don't have to buy a new data, data management system, right? So Fedora is trying to abstract away the data. I mean, not just Fedora, the whole repository movement is trying to provide and separate the data management from the usage. And so that's where Fedora was designed. We, we've sort of concentrated on the data management layer, and we're leaving the usage up to the end user. And a lot of the developing of these kinds of applications, so a learning object kind of system, you can take advantage of a lot of um, very powerful um, characteristics that Fedora brings to the table, but you still have to turn those data objects into learning objects in some sense. You're still providing the experience to the users that make those data objects, learning objects, because of the way they're used, the way they're presented. So Fedora doesn't do, I mean, the problem here, if we had tried to anticipate all the use cases um, that Fedora makes possible, we'd still be back at the beginning trying to develop all the applications. So we took the approach that we're putting out the foundation, and it's there for other people to develop the applications. And we're seeing, we're starting to see more and more of them now coming out faster and faster. Great. Hopefully I answer your question. Great. Operator, do we have any uh, questions in the queue? Uh, yes, we do have a question from Brian Westra. Um, but first here, if you would like to ask a question, as a reminder, just press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Brian, your line is open. Thanks. I, um, he, he already answered my question. It was about the programming requirements. Thanks. Sure. So while we're waiting for other people to queue up, we have another question here, Thorny. Um, from Jane Wang, is the UVA Fedora implementation a homegrown app or built up, built upon some product? Um, the, the, the bits and pieces I was showing of the UVA application were our original implementation when it was designed in 2002, <laughs> um, and it was, it's still in operation there, but um, they're actually working on something else. So I don't work there anymore. I can't tell you where they're going now. But the one that you can see if you go to digital, the digital initiative site at UVA, there is no application software. There's a search index, and everything that you see is done by disseminators. When we, when we um, developed that approach, we were replacing the, a, a set of web servers that all the different electronic centers that UVA had developed, and they all had their own way of doing different kinds of data, but it was all CGI driven. Since you're familiar with web programming, the first, first way of doing powerful web programming was called CGI, which was all server side, and so when we got interested in Fedora, it was, our first move was to reproduce the server side approach. So you can do that with Fedora. So what we have there is when you get started, every object has a default disseminator, which gives you a set of methods that you don't have to know what kind of object you've got. So I can say, get preview of that object, which will, if it's a thumbnail, it'll give me a, I mean, if it's an image, it'll give me a thumbnail. If it's a text, it'll give me a string of text, title, and author of the book or whatever. If I have get full view, it will give me a view that is the starter view, if you will, of the web page. So it gives you, it renders the book, the starting point for the book, and puts all the different disseminations under the, under the, um, the links on the page, the menus and things. So everything you see there is done with a disseminator. And once you search and you find an object and you click on its hit, the first hit 
has the URL buried in it that is the, the get default view of that object. And from then on, it's, that's the bootstrap dissemination. And then it just, it's all disseminations from there. So there is no, no real. Now, the way people want to write websites now, that doesn't work very well because Ajax kind of clients, which are much more powerful and you can do a lot more with. So we wouldn't do it again that way now. And that's where UVA is moving in another direction. Um, but the idea there is that your Ajax client has knowledge of these different data products, the virtualized data products that can get out of the repository. So the, the person writing the Ajax web interface for your institution can, uh, can rely on those different views of the objects being there and then build their, you know, do the calls back to the, and in the discovery process, get streams of PIDs, and then use those PIDs with the pre-known different kinds of disseminations to get these, the data products they want to do this, whatever they want to do. So, and I know all that <laughs> doesn't really tell you what you can go out and buy to use Fedora, <laughs> but I mean, a lot of the use of Fedora is is about building indexes and then making the uh, whatever happens when the user clicks on those hits in the in the search or the browse functions that you're giving them, um, that it uses the repository to get the data products and they're styled and you do whatever you want with them in a, in a client kind of way. A lot of the application software that people are designing for Fedora is really aimed at workflow kinds of processes so that you can, um, people in things like libraries and other museums or wherever they're using Fedora can, can have a much more intuitive interface for managing the data. So a lot of the work that's going that needs to be done is, is all about uh, um, managing the data and putting it in there and you know updating it and all that stuff. The actual access is usually coming through some kind of search interface. I know UVA is working on something called Black Light right now, which is a um, um, faceted browsing kind of system based on solar that's very nice. It's a open source project that's about to be out version one. So a lot of their the access that UVA is in their new system is coming through Blacklight. But again, it's it's mostly exposing the whatever metadata about the objects you want into some search interface. Or maybe two search interfaces, the resource index where you have all the RDF and the a full text index using Blacklight where you're you know, letting the users search around through data. And then when they start actually asking for the data, they're actually working with client systems that are talking to Fedora to get the data that needs for any particular call. I hope that answers your question. Operator, do we have any more questions on the line? I show no questions from the phone. Okay, great. Um, Tony, we have a couple more questions that came off in the chat okay. box. This is from Michael Levy. Have you heard of... Uh, the TAL, the I T A L, which is a commercial product. Any word on that versus says um, Miradora and other systems? Well, they're they're all fairly different things. I can tell you that um, uh, I don't. Know, I frankly, I don't know what's going on with Vital Right at the moment. I haven't been in touch with them in quite a while. Um, I know says is an ongoing project. Um, it's got its own user community that's cranking away, and I would put you in touch with them to find out. They're um, essentially built around an, uh, the idea of institutional repositories, and they provide a very flexible, um, configurable environment that's specifically designed for that use case, much like the DSpace kind of use case. Says was really aimed at that same, in that same area, I think it's safe to say. Miradora was, um, was really um, put out as a as a proof of concept for a bunch of work that that the group in Australia was doing with security, um, some new ideas about how to do security with Fedora or even about Fedora. But um, and it took on a life of its own. It's a very interesting application. It it can function as just a, a an interface on an existing Fedora repository. It doesn't dominate the repository the way that. Um, I think I think Vital does, and I know Fez does. It has its own private repository that it makes a lot of assumptions about. Miradora doesn't do that as much. It it, it can be one face among other faces on the same repository. Um, it is now a project that's that's got its own standing. It wasn't for, in the beginning, but now it is a project on its own, and it's got a team that's working on it again at Macquarie University. So it's a viable project. Um, 
since it's not a dead project at all. Um, they're working on it really hard. So another thing that's coming is something that I've been working closely with um, University of Virginia, Stanford, and Hull University, University of Hull, excuse me. Um, it's called, right now it's called Hydra, and uh, the information is on the Fedora Wiki, which is if you go to the home page at the very top and click on Wiki and look down the left-hand side of the Wiki table of contents, you'll find something about Hydra. It's aimed at being... Um, a more general um, kind of toolkit for building applications and with an out-of-the-box experience as well. And it's really aimed long-term at um, that scholars repository kind of application where you can have, say, all your faculty and students doing their activities, creating information, and they're putting stuff in repositories that they, they don't really know. I mean, it, it sort of is, their tools are connected up to the repositories as the goal. And that project is aimed at that. But it, um, it'll, it's aiming to have software in use at Stanford and UVA by the fall. Um, I don't know when its first release of an out-of-the-box piece of software will be exactly, but you know, pretty fast turnaround time for the first version. And Island Door is another one that's out there that's um, on the Fedora website. You can find information about it. It's uh, the Drupal-based system that's been put on top Fedora. Um, so. Are there any other questions from Kyle Fenton? When will native MET, M-E-T-S, to be available as opposed to FOSM? We started with METS and we moved away from it because it was not as efficient. Um, you can get METS objects out of Fedora all you want right now. You can, you can have a METS file be a data stream in a Fedora object, but the Foxmall schema more directly expresses and is much more efficient for operation for Fedora objects. Um, but like I said, you can export your entire Fedora repository into MET files if you want to. Okay. So we uh, won't move back to it. Um, another question from Michael Levy. Is that OAI model, P-R-O-A-I, implementation considered ready for production applications or more of, or will there be more of a test model Pro-OAI Pro has been in the package for four years now, I think. So, I mean, the newest version, I think there were some bugs that have been fixed now, but, but it has been ready for production, as far as I know. A couple more questions here. Um, are, this is from Amalon Ferguson. Are there companies that work with boards who don't have the necessary skill sets in-house to the door to build an enterprise image management system that will enable other enterprise apps to interface with it? Yes, um, there are definitely companies. There's a, a variety of them. If you, if you go to the website and go to that community button I talked about, talked about, you can see there's a list of vendors there, and those are people who are doing business with Fedora. Um, I mentioned Media Shelf, which is Matt Zumwalt's Zim company. He's done lots of work with different developing systems for different people. There's a couple of companies in the UK, Acuity Unlimited and uh, Activate, which is a non-government organization that works with um, emerging um, libraries and, and institutions in emerging countries. It's a non-profit that develops some systems based on Fedora. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of them that we know are going on, but again, they're not telling us. I mean, they're out there doing stuff, and we don't know about them. But the ones that I know about are listed there, and if um, you can always send email to the contact, and I'll, I can connect people up if you want. But um, I, I should say that a lot of these people do turn up at the Open Repositories Conference. So if you're interested and you're able to go um, in May in Atlanta this year, um, there's going to be um, a, a real big Fedora presence at that conference. And a lot of these people who are developers will definitely be there. Hey, um, another question from Keisha Manning. Um, the question is, can you combine Fedora with a custom app to sell? Can you? Oh, sure. The way we've gone out of our way from the beginning and we've moved even less restrictive over time to make the license as friendly to reuse as possible. So people who want to use our Fedora software, the open source software, to make money and make a product, they don't even have to give back changes they make to Fedora anymore. It's using the Apache 2 license as of, I think, version 3.0. 
which just basically holds on to copyright and does some legal mumbo jumbo about uh, um, um, legal, um, you know, some of the legal requirements. I forget even what it. But basically, it doesn't require you to do anything. Um, unlike some of the the GPL and some of the other licenses, so there's, there's some question about what they really do. But people worry that if you write um, your own software using a GPL component inside that you have to make it available GPL, but Fedora, we went out of our way so that doesn't have to happen. So yes, you can do anything you want with it. Okay. Um, another question from Martin. Has anyone used Greenstone on top of Fedora? I have, I have seen an article that talked about an implementation of Greenstone on top of Fedora, but I don't know. I don't have personal knowledge of it. So I, I can tell you if you look at Greenstone and Fedora in Google, you should be able to find information about it. It has been done. Okay, great. I have three more questions. Um, the first question is from Yin Zhang. Do you support educational programs for digital library education by providing service to students? Uh, we do not at this time. We talked about um, making server space available. If any of you saw the DuraSpace presentation a month ago, um, where Fedora is getting into business with um, with the DSpace Foundation, together we're looking into starting a company that works on cloud computing, and uh, it's starting to get into some of that. I mean, that's one of the possible outcomes is we'll provide um, online repository space to, to users. Okay, but um, we're not doing it at this time. Hello? This is the conference coordinator. Would you like to take some questions from the phone? I don't know if anyone's still there. So we've got the parties online, and we do have two parties queued up at this time to ask questions. Well, you can tell you can tell you. I'm happy to take more questions. Okay, uh, we do have a question from Amalyn Ferguson. Your line is open. Uh, it was already answered, so I put it in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, our next question comes from Ruth Dewar. Your line is open. Bruce, your line is open for a question. I don't really hear anything. Bruce, you may want to check your mute button. Bruce Dewar, your line is open for questions. Maybe she didn't have a question anymore. That was all the audio questions we had from the phone. Okay, great. Let's go back to these last three questions. Um, again, this is from Matthias Tobler. Has anyone used the door for natural history questions where taxonic data needs to be managed? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of work going on with that um, in different places. I don't, I, I can't really point you to an example, but I know there's a bunch of people working with it. Um, but so yes, that's one of the, you know, doing semantic sort of knowledge bases with Fedora is a really interesting, it has a lot of really interesting possibilities. I mean, you can make objects that represent all of the, the nodes in that, in that ontology that you're developing. And then you, you're able to, you know, manage the data and version and all that stuff. And then you can turn it into an RDF index for use, but you have a back-end durable version of all that data. So um, I know there are people working with that for sure. Okay, our last question, Thorny. I'm sure Robert Swain, will we ever see DSpace as a front end to Fedora? <laughs> That's up to DSpace, actually. We're working very close with DSpace now. Um, like I said, we're working on a business model together. The new version of DSpace is, is going to be built on top of this Akubra storage plugin, which is something we developed at Fedora Commons, and now we're developing jointly with them. So both of our uh, I think our, as of 3.1, I think our Fedora is on top of a Cougar, which is a, it's an abstract storage plugin that gives you a way to talk to those backend storage systems. The, the next version of DSpace, which they're working on right now, will be built on that. I don't know where it's going to go down the road, but we certainly are talking all the time, and we, and whatever it may look like from, from out in the world, we have a very friendly relationship with, with DSpace people. 
So um, it's up to them. I mean, they have a very, um, they started out from a different extreme than we did. We started out with no no application on top, and they started out with a very specific use case, and they did the complete vertical development of software and integration of it to do that use case. We started out saying, we're building a foundation to serve all use cases. So we've sort of been working from our extremes back towards the middle, I think, and maybe we're going to meet in the middle. There are no, as far as I know, there's no plans right now to develop the next version of, of DSpace as a Fedora application. Okay, great. I think this is uh, the end of our webinar session today. Thank you, Thorny, and thank you, Gail, for your time. Um, this session has been recorded, and a replay of the audio and the presentation will be sent to all participants um, within the next couple of days. Um, so thank you, everybody, for your time, and um, we look forward to seeing you at our at our next series um, on April the. I think it's April the 15th. Please check the Fedora and 